Okay, good evening uh, to everyone, um, and maybe welcome back. Welcome to this uh, second presentation of the of the evening of our first RBI Days uh, uh, Netherlands. Yeah, the, our plan was to um, to to start RBI Days Netherlands um, as an in-person meeting, um, but we uh, we had to switch to uh, this online uh, presentation, but uh, that uh, that worked out uh, pretty well. So to start, let's say first thanks to uh, Pen Company, who uh, would be our uh, first in-person um, uh, sponsor for the uh, for the first event in uh, in the Netherlands. Um, I'm sure we will get. Uh, uh, back to them in one of our future, uh, and also uh, for Jan uh, Milkens for helping us out uh, to, to set up this, uh, this first meetup. So I'm, uh, I'm Nicky van Voenhoven, um, together with uh, Mark Lelyveld, uh, we set up this um, meetup, and we just had the first presentation by Melissa Coates, uh, which is also recorded, so we can, uh, can view the recording afterwards. Um, now this presentation uh, is going to be by uh, Benny de Jager about troubleshooting Power BI and uh, uh, report performance. Benny is uh, a senior data insights consultant at uh, Real Dolman with uh, a focus on the Microsoft data and uh, AI tech. And uh, he has recently also been um, uh, awarded uh, the MVP as a uh, Microsoft uh, Data Platform MVP. Uh, so uh, welcome, Benny. Thanks. So Good let me just you. say that I'm uh, I'm really happy to to see uh, sessions kicking off for Power BI Days in the Netherlands as well. And then uh, I am really looking forward to getting this show on the road. I have to say that I've been having uh, issues in the uh, the session with Melissa with audio, so I am hoping that everything holds up. But in any case, let's get started. Um, let me just get started uh, by adding a few more things. Uh, if you want to reach out to me via the social channels, you can uh, reach out to me via the social handles that I've included there. Uh, but other than that, doing things for a company called Real Dolman. Um, I also do things in a uh, user group in Belgium called Data Minds. We do user group evenings, uh, all, all sorts of things, and I really enjoy doing that. And then that's also what got me into speaking uh, as well, and um, it's been it's been fun as well. But most importantly, and I think Mark will uh, definitely, definitely <laughs> agree with me on that, is the last <laughs> bullet point, and that's say no to pie charts. I really, I really can't emphasize enough that we shouldn't keep using pie charts wherever we see it fit. But let me kick off in the session. If there's any questions, I'll try, uh, I'll try to keep, uh, keep some space for questions as well, but I tend to talk a lot during sessions, uh, but I will definitely try to keep room for questions as well. If you have any more questions afterwards, just reach out to me through the social channels and I'll happily help you out. But what do I have outlined for you today as a session objective? What do I want you to take home? Well, do I want you to take with you out of the session is how you can start for yourself to start pinpointing common causes in performance issues. And mainly um, it's it's finding those issues is one thing, but how you can avoid those issues from occurring, how you can prevent those things is even better. So mainly I want to I want to make sure that you can have a set of techniques, a set of best practices with you as well to try and keep those things from happening because that will end up that will end up you saving not having to put effort into those kind of things, and you can focus on other more fun, more interesting things. Although I do have to say that investigating going all Sherlock Holmes on performance issues, I do really like that from time to time. But what this isn't, and this is very important as well, this is not a tax performance deep dive. Um, if you want, if you're looking for a session like this, I really encourage you to go look for uh, sessions by Marco Russo or Alberto Ferrari. There's webinars out there, there's articles out there. And they can really help you get a look at DAX and what you can do with it and how you can really go further into it. But why on earth should we actually even bother looking at performance troubleshooting? Well, the thing is, it's really simple because no one likes to wait. I, for instance, I get annoyed if I have to look at a loading screen for more than 10, 15 seconds for something. So I really dislike waiting on, on anything. And Power BI is not an exception to that. Um, there is There is something, well, there is, some some leeway in, in what kind of weight types that we have, but in general, it's not fun. And also, um, I've used this in the past as well, is the fact that if you use works on my machine as an excuse, that is that is the most unvalid of replies that we can ever have, because there is a big difference in what kind of machine that a user is using to consume your report, whether he's doing it on the Power BI desktop file, whether he's doing it through a browser, whichever browser he uses or they use, or if they are using a mobile application. Um, those things really vary on how they're consuming their report. But if we'd have to say that what is 
problem is troubleshooting exactly? Well, it is, you can actually go out and divide it to a very scientific formula, meaning that it's it's science, meaning knowing what you have to do, and then art, meaning that, well, how you should do it and having a certain flair of it. And then the last part is, is not to be neglected because it's, sometimes it's just sheer dumb luck. You cannot know everything that's, that's a possible root cause for performance issues. You cannot know everything. You cannot train everything. So you will have to look for certain things. You will have to bring some things. And that's not that's not a problem. We keep learning every single day. And that is why it is really important to not underestimate the luck part of going into troubleshooting Power BI report performance. But it is also very important to keep in mind context and baseline. And what do I mean with that is the fact that what kind of report are we looking at? Are we looking at a report that's based on a data set that has about 85 million rows in transactional data? Or are we looking at a report that has an Excel file with 25, 25 records in it? It is, what are we looking at? How much data is in, is after, is, is in the data model? How, and, and what are we doing with it? And the other thing is baseline as well. What are the expectations? Are they expecting it to be done in two seconds? Or are they aware of the fact that it's a lot of data on in the data model? And they are okay with waiting five to ten seconds, for, 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 for instance. So those are things that are really important to keep in mind as well. So I am a consultant. That means that I do end up at different clients, and um, some of those assignments that I do with clients are really short, meaning that they're two, three, four days. So typically, whenever I need to start doing assignments like these, I try to go for quick wins on reports that are heavily used. So I go in, I go in and look at the Power BI activity log to see what are the reports that are used most commonly, and then um, where could I be getting some quick wins? And how you can go for quick wins is, is partially where I'm getting at in this session as well. Because getting those quick wins will get you uh, will get you trust with your, with your customer, with your end user, and, and it's all about trust. Because those people trust you to invest time into something, to, to, to look things up for them. And if there's no trust, well, you can, can pretty much not get anywhere with results and then most importantly as well is that you want to avoid going into long investigations locking yourself into a dark cellar for about five days on reports that are barely used unless it's c-level uh, people because they eventually also decide about the budgets and the budgets is what pays us as well it pays employees pays consultants so it is also things to keep in mind as well but as i said i am a consultant and this is my go-to answer it is the most annoying of answers, but it is most of the time, it is actually what it boils down to. There are always a bunch of unknown factors in there. And it is also it is also not always possible to know everything that we need to know. So the answer will mostly be, it depends, but you can go look further into it. Anyway, let's get started. The thing is that um, there is something that we need to know before we get started on troubleshooting Power, Power BI report performance. There is something that we need to be aware of, and that is this thing called the noisy neighbor. And a noisy neighbor is a phrase, um, I'm sorry for the dog outside that's barking, but there is this thing called noisy neighbor, which is effectively just this right now. Um, and that is this thing that we are, most of us are running on shared capacity, meaning that we have a Power BI account and that has a pro subscription and we use capacity that is a shared. Because for instance, my organization has pro licenses and Mark's organization has pro licenses as well. And Nikki's organization, well, they have premium, but they'll have pro, they'll have pro as well. And all of us are using the same infrastructure, the same capacity. So let's say for instance, that all three of us are doing big operations at the same time. There will be a heavier load on that capacity. Will it be a noticeable effect? Well, if it's only the three of us, then probably not. But if it's more, um, if it's a lot of people that are doing the same things as well, then it's possible that, it will, that there will be an effect on, on that capacity. The main thing that you need to understand for this is that it's very impossible, it's nearly impossible to benchmark exactly to the millisecond with shared capacity, even with premium capacity and dedicated capacity, that is nearly impossible. So it is always going to be, a factor and 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 some some margin that you can that you can trust when benchmarking things. But shared capacity also means that it is a blessing and a curse because the thing is that we don't need to think about a lot of things because everything that the shared capacity does for us in handling things like model management, etc., is also being done in premium capacity. But 
handling things like like we need more we need more load and then if we add more users and let's say let's say we add 50 more users and they'll start they'll start putting in reports that are, that go to their personal that go to their personal data set size we don't need to worry about any of those things let's say that if we do have premium capacity well we have premium capacity for a limited amount a limited amount of of of, of data set size and then we can go over it but there can only be a limited amount of data set sizes that can be in the memory. So that is a blessing and a curse. And the most common misconception that I've heard about premium as well is that um, premium automatically solves every performance issue that's out there. And this could not be more untrue because premium does allow you to have a more granular control of things, but you do also have to control these things. So it does not automat automatically solve any of these things. Because you could actually also just wreck performance badly for uh, for anything that you might have there. So, and then the last thing that I want to note on this slide as well is that caching mechanisms are something that you really need to keep keep in mind. Because let's say that we have a data set and we're doing something, we're browsing and consuming a report, and then we go away, we we go back to the home screen in Power BI, and we come back, and all of a sudden that report loads super fast. So we think we think to ourselves, oh, well, we fixed it. That's great. We can go home now. Well, it is not exactly that because caching means that results are being cached temporarily into a separate into a separate block of memory and that can be reused the second the same query needs to be rendered again. And that is that is a good thing, but you also need to keep that in mind when you're looking for performance troubleshooting issues because caching can really give you a false sense of positivity. But I've um, all the demo reports that I do, they're based on uh, this data sets are based on bikes. I wanted to make the one first of the hometown that I live in, Antwerp, uh, because they have these city bikes as well, but they wouldn't give the data set to me. Um, so I went out and look, I went out on the hunt for a different data set. And I found the data set for the New York City bikes. They have essentially the same thing, but bigger, way bigger than the Antwerp bikes. And they pretty much they pretty much give me everything that I want to have. They give me to the granular level about every trip that's been made for starting at a public station, uh, where it starts, where it ends, how long it took, what type of customer it is. So they give me a bunch of, of data that I can relevantly use to start looking at a demo set because I cannot use Power BI, I cannot use customer data for these kinds of presentations. So this is a data set size that I think at this point it's running at about 90 million transactions at the at the trip level, so that that's that's something to get started with to start doing some uh, some things in Power BI. And I do have to mention as well is that um, I like breaking things in Power BI on purpose. Well, I like breaking things on purpose in general, which is um, something that helps you learn as well. And this data set just helped me do it as well. So there is a set of reports that I've made on it, and then I will quickly show you the report. So it is the most beautiful of reports that I've ever made. Um, Mark will definitely love this one, I know for a fact. So it is the most beautiful of, most beautiful of reports because if I browse down here on this pie chart, this gives me the most beautiful beautiful thing that I've ever seen in my entire life. But it is, it is, not, the, it is not the report that, that matters here so much. There are a few things that are not less than optimal in this report. And uh, there are things that we can go look for as well. But this is mainly just the trip data that I've mentioned before, and then made into a dimensional model, and then some tax measures onto it. But that is just the report that I have. The thing is that how I got to this report is actually what matters most in the story that I'm about to tell you. But I will get back to this. But first, I do have to close this one up so I can clear a bit of memory as well. So let's get back. The thing is as well is that if we're running Power BI desktop on our local machine, there's a bunch of things that are happening in there. So to the to the naked eye, we just execute Power BI desktop.exe and it does everything for us. And that is essentially true. But running that executable starts up a bunch of things, a bunch of a bunch of processes on our local machine. And that is also very important because remember when I said works on my machine is not a valid reply? Because when, for instance, we're sharing Power BI desktop files, which is not a best practice for sharing, as Melissa just explained to us as well, um, there is a different kind of things that we're using, um, meaning that there are a bunch of processes running there. 
and the main one in, in there is the one that's the one that's nominated with an arrow as well is SQL Server Analysis Services. There is a local version of Analysis Service running on the machine that is hosting the Power BI desktop file. But there's more things as well in there. There's also these things called Microsoft Mashup Evaluation Containers, which is effectively um, which is effectively all the Power Query processes, all the M queries that we're using. They are also being executed on the local machine when we're running Power BI files. And then this one as well, is, is the coolest one because I had never thought of this one to happen as well. That is, all these things, these browser sub-processes, they are, they are visual rendering of your visuals. So the rendering of the visuals also triggers a bunch of these processes. And then the thing that we do have to realize in this entire thing is that as soon as I upload this file, a bunch of this is not going, is going away from the local, local machines that we're using it. So the SQL Server analysis services, well, that's being hosted in shared capacity or dedicated capacity. The Power Query query is as well. They're also being executed there. Maybe a bit of them will be executed in query folding to, towards the uh, towards the database service, but that's not the question here. The thing is that those browser subprocesses, they are executed on the local machine of the user consuming your report. And that is where the choice of browser, the choice of machine comes into play as well because that can have a very big effect on what we're doing with the, the, the report performance that we have. So that is something to very much keep an eye on as well. But how do, how do, how do get started with these things? How do get started with troubleshooting Power BI report performance has become a lot easier um, because there was this functionality introduced in May 2019, which is the performance analyzer. Um, it went public in May 2019, and it is pretty much just a flight recorder for all the operations that we have. Meaning that um, if we're if we're more old school in SQL Server, it is like Profiler. Uh, there's a big debate going on about Profiler and and uh, and team team extended events, but this is essentially a bit like Profiler. You just start it up, and it lists every single operation that you have done. And then it gives you uh, some information about execution times, and it allows you to export those things, and it also allows you to quickly see what's going on underneath there. And then the screenshot that I'm showing there is by this time is is, is ridiculously aged in EU time, because there is a bunch of there is a bunch of uh, ribbon updates and and Power BI desktop updates that have a new look and feel for the entire thing. But I will just show it to you as well. Uh, so the thing is that when I go to a Power BI it is essentially the same report that I was showing just now. And I've intentionally put in a blank page here because it is very important to notice thing as well. Because the Power BI uh, performance analyzer pane kicks off after you started. So the second I open my report like I just did before, all of those queries that have been visualized will have already been loaded once, meaning that the second I hit I had the performance analyzer pane, I will be hitting cache for some of those things, which is not the thing that I want to do. I want the worst case scenario. So I want to know what the worst case scenario can be, what the worst loading time can be for all of those different kinds of visuals. So how do we get started with our, uh, how do we get started with our performance analyzer pane? Meaning that it is, it has been, it's essentially still the same thing, but it's located on the view tab. So if you're if you're running another uh, another ribbon or, or or whatever, it is still the same thing. It just looks a bit different, but it is still located under the view tab. And then you can have the sync slicer, sync slicer button. And if you click that, a new panel pops up. No, sorry, not the sync slicer panel. The performance analyzer panel pops up, and the, the button start recording is what we need to click before doing anything else. So the second we start recording. This will now log every action that's going to occur. So if and when I go to a new tab, uh, to another tab in my report, a bunch of things is going to happen. So there is all of those, all of those tiles that are in there, all of the visuals that I have in there. They're all rendering, and this this is kind of cool because this effectively allows me to to look at what's happening. And uh, the overly detailed matrix is is done on purpose so that there's something in there that runs for a very long time. Um, the main thing that we can get to look at is as well is let's say for instance that if I want to go ahead and look at one of the car tiles, um, one of the car tiles gives me three types of 
times that it's been waiting on. It gives me a wait time for a DAX query, it gives me a wait time for a visual display, and it gives me a wait time for other. And those are three very unique things that we do need to, to keep into account. Because the DAX query is when it's getting data from the model, when it's doing transformations in, in, in inside the formula engine, all those kind of things. That's how long it takes for getting the data from the model, getting it into the right shape, and returning it to the visual. So 230 milliseconds is not that bad. And then it took me 19 milliseconds to render the visual display, which is, well, it's a card visual with a with a background, which is not that bad. Um, but it spent almost two seconds waiting on other. And that's the thing that's that's really confusing. But what is what is this other thing? Um, the main reason for this is the fact that it's waiting on other things, on other visuals to render. Because Power BI can handle, I don't, I don't know the exact number, but my guess is that it's about four or five different things in parallel. So it can handle four or five visuals to render at the same time, and then it's spent waiting on other things, waiting on other visuals to render, and then it can kick off. So that is the most common wait type that we have, which also brings me down to the fact that do you really need these many visuals, this many visuals on your report? Do you really need to have them? That is that is one of the common things I see when when looking at reports. There are 40 different visuals on there, and they're spent they're stuck waiting for for a long rendering time of all those visuals. And, and they they even thought that they were smart and they used they were using custom page sizes. And then it it's essentially just has a has you waiting a long time for things that could be split up into more effective things. But that is report design and canvas layouts, which is an entirely different discussion as well. But that is one of the main things that I want to give to you as well, is that try to limit the amount of visuals on there because you will have a very long wait time for this other wait time, wait type. So that is that is how we can get started with this. It means that we have very long wait types for other. But um, let's say for instance, that I want to go ahead and sort my, sort my, my the rendering of these visuals and sort it by other things. Let's say visual displays, for instance. How long did it take to render it? Uh, let's say descending, how long did it take to render? Well, to no big surprise, the map, this one took the longest time to render visually because there is just a bunch of data points on a map, which is no which is no, no big surprise here. Um, you do have to keep in mind that the visual rendering gets booted back to the end user as well for a big part. So the end user has to do a lot of this work. So I'm running this now on my, my work machine laptop, which is a pretty a pretty okay thing. But let's just say that um, your colleagues in procurement have a less powerful laptop and they're running on older hardware. If they have to render the same map, it can potentially take them longer to render the same thing, which is, which is again why I'm saying that works on my machine is the worst replies of every fall that we can have. So how can we limit that? How can we limit the, the visual the visual rendering? Well, do you really need that many data points on your map? Can we not look at heat maps, for instance, and have less have less rendering times in those things? Well, it is things that you do need to look at for yourself and we need to go deeper into it as well. But the most common of wait types, and actually the one that I see the most of the time, is the DAX. Why am I waiting a very long time on DAX? And if I go ahead and sort it again based on the the longest DAX waiting time, well, it's no big surprise that the overly detailed matrix took a long time because it is effectively just every, it is to the granular level, every row that I have put into a matrix, which is done on purpose. And that's not that's not effectively, because now it's going to render again because I've clicked something somewhere. Um, so I'm not going into looking into that one, but let's just say that um, the total duration quarter over quarter, let's just say that I want to look at what's what's underneath there. And then I can go ahead and copy the query. And then if I open up my favorite, uh, my favorite browser of all, Notepad++, I can pop it in there. And then I can look at what it is, uh, which is pretty OK for a text statement. But the thing is that um, this is just Notepad, and it's no, there's no syntax highlighting, and it's not that easy as well. There's other tools out there that we can use. And this is where, um, this is where it gets really cool, because we had a webinar uh, two weeks ago, I think, from Christian Wade about uh, where they're going at with enterprise grade things for Power BI. And one of the things they mentioned is that they'll, they're looking at integrating things with Power BI as well. But one of the tools that I've been using for this for a very long time is DAX Studio. 
And Next Studio is a tool that's been made by Darren Gospel, Gospel, I think, um, and he's he's an Australian MVP, and he put a lot of effort into this. But they you probably know it because Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari they are heavily heavily invested into this as well. But it is an amazing tool because we can just connect to any Power BI model that's open on our local machine. So for instance, now we have this Power BI report file that I've have open for me. So I can connect to that model and I can go ahead and look at all the, the tables that I've got in there and, and whatever fields that I have in there. And then I can also go ahead and look at my measures and all the things that I've got defined. So I can also go ahead and look at how is this, how is this measure, how is this DAX measure, how does it relate to what I have in my model? And that is something that um, it is a slippery slope to go in because it is very hard to master DAX and effectively effectively going for how how it all ties together is not the easiest of things. And again, if you want to go deeper into that, I highly recommend you go look at sqlbi.com or radicat.com from Reza. There is a bunch of community content out there that can help you get started on troubleshooting in DAX specifically. But the main thing what I do with DAX Studio to get started is, well, the first and foremost thing is that I heavily use the clear cache button because you want to avoid hitting the cache where we have it. But the main thing why I use this as well is looking at this thing called server timings. The server timings gives me an idea of how my query is performing against my data model. Is my data model sufficient for being able to handle the request that DAX measure is sending, or is or is a lot of the things done on the fly, meaning that are a lot of the things being taken out of the formula, uh, out of the storage engine, out of the data model, and then a lot of things, a lot of operations being done on there in memory on the fly, because that's a very important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at DAX measures as well. But as soon as I've cleared my cache and I've made sure that server timings are enabled, I can go ahead and run my query. And this will give me the same result that I had, uh, meaning that the result that also came back in my file. But the main thing that I want to go look at here now is these two things, because there is a bunch of things happening in here. There's a bunch of things happening in there that are SQL-like kind of queries, which allows to give you some some level of detail what's been doing. But the most important thing that we're looking at are these two things, meaning that we're looking at these thing called FE and SE. Because that is what effectively tells me if it's if it's doing the majority of my work on SE, that means that my data model is sufficient. My data model can handle the request that's being sent. If 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 the majority of the work is being shifted to FE, that means that there is a lot of complex DAX being done. And complex DAX does not always have to be complex because that is actually the second thing that I really want you to bear in mind as well is that DAX does not have to be complex. There is a lot of people that write complex DAX doing a lot of things in calculated columns and then calculated tables and variables that can actually also be done in the model. And if we're doing them in the model, probably our model will get bigger, but it is also optimized for output because we're allowing the engine to do its proper work. But that is the main thing that I want to show you for DAX Studio. You can go really deep into this, but again, uh, go look up what they have, what the SQLBI.com guys have on this topic, because they have some very interesting content that can help you get started with this as well. But to get started, look at these two things. FE and SE. Uh, formula engine and storage engine. And try to get as much going on the storage engine as you can. So back to the drawing board. There is um, a bunch of tools that I use well. So the tools that I've just shown you are Performance Analyzer, Pain, and Back Studio. They are the tools that I use quite common, but there are three more that I use very, very frequently. And actually the one that I use the most is this thing called VertiPack Analyzer. And VertiPack Analyzer is included in Back Studio these days, but I'm, I'm a bit old school. I just prefer opening, opening up the Excel file and looking at it because it gives me a bit more level of detail that I want to have. But what VertiPack Analyzer does is effectively just a power pivot model. And that power pivot model connects to the internals of my Power BI desktop file or my tabular model. And it gives me a bunch of metadata. And that's that's the metadata that I can look at to start analyzing my models, to start looking at, is my model actually properly done? Because by now you're probably getting, you're understanding where I'm getting at. Meaning that um, I'm going at, I'm going at fix the model because that is the most important thing. 
So let's say, for instance, that if I go ahead and open up one of these files that I've made beforehand, this just gives me um, this just gives me a really compare well a really well put overview of everything that I've got inside my model. And then by opening this up right here on the screen, there's a few things that trigger me very very badly from the back, from right from the start. But we'll get into that as well later on. But it is effectively just all the tables that I've got in there, and then how big are they? And why is this important information for me? Well, this is effectively um, the thing about size, because size is a very important aspect in Power BI as well, because it is quite quite clear that the second you have the, the data set size is smaller, the less time it will take to start scanning your entire data set. Um, so, so the thing is that um, the data set size, if it's smaller, it will take less time for, to, for Power BI to scan the entire thing. And if it takes less time to scan the entire thing, it'll give you back the results quicker as well. And then the most common technique on, on how you can effectively start doing that is quite simple. It is by dimensional modeling, by making star schemes in there. And that is one of the more performant ways to start building out your models as well for this entire thing. But I've connected to one of the, one of the early steps in my model, and that effectively just means that I can go ahead and look to this thing. Because let's say, for instance, trips, I know for a fact that this is my, my fact table. I know for a fact that this is all the trips that have been done in uh, 2019 and 2018, because I've limited the data set size. Um, so the thing is that there's a bunch of data in here that's not completely relevant for the model as well, because that is, that is there's, there's things in here that take up a lot of size that are probably not going to be used as well in the model. And those, it's, if we can start eliminating those things, well, that'll that means that we can go ahead and and have well have a better performance as well. Because if those things that we don't need are in, aren't in there, well, it is more easy for us as well. And then the thing is as well, the most important thing to keep in mind is the data size and the dictionary size, because that's effectively what's what's where the magic is happening. Because the thing is that. If we look at our data size and if we look at our dictionary size, it means that how much, how big is the data that we have in there? Well, and then the dictionary is uh, whatever, what is what Power BI is doing when compressing the data. So depending on the data type that you have and the amount of distinct values that are in there, it'll start making up, it'll start creating a dictionary. And that dictionary means effectively that it's looking at, well, I have row one to 5,000 and that has this value. I've row 5,000 to 7,203, that has this value. And it, it goes up and builds this entire thing. So by splitting those two apart, this will allow the column store engine, the column store indexes that are being that are being ran inside the model of Power BI, this will allow them to do, well, pretty much everything that they need to do. This will allow them to have this very, very, very performant compression that we all that we all love, because that compression allows things to allows queries to be ran super effectively. So mainly what we want to have most most of the times that we can inside our model is, is values that, that don't occur too much, meaning that the cardinality of it is very low. And that is where it gets really interesting because if I'm looking at for 16 million, 16 million entries that I have right here, well, the start time and the stop time has about 16 million unique rows as well. And that takes up a very, very, very large portion of my entire my entire table size. Because if I go ahead and look into this as well, is that if I look at my table size and my data size, well, I see that those two things take up about 80%, 85% of my entire model. Those those two fields, the start time and the stop time, they take up a lot of a lot of space, which is probably something that we want to go look at. And in general, when I'm modeling, I pretty much always split the two of them together. And then I debate the fact that do we really need to have data to the millisecond? Can we just have hour and minute? Is that not sufficient for us? Even hour sometimes um, is sufficient if we need time altogether. But another thing that this allows me very quickly to see is the fact that, well, what's being done, what dirty tricks are, are being executed as well? Because one of my pet peeves when looking at models is the fact that I really dislike seeing calculated columns because calculated columns are not. Um, they're not persisted in the model. They're always added on top of the model that's been made. And then those calculations get done every single time data needs to be rendered. 
data is not hitting the cat data is not coming from cache and that is um, it is less efficient and it really blows up your model as well and I see a bunch of these things a bunch of these uh, calculated columns in here as well and they are effectively just coming from the out of date time set which is one of the other things that I really advise you to not do as well but I really need to get back to another tool as well because there is one more tool that I want to show you, and this will become very important in the future. Because um, there are things happening in, with the Power BI desktop file as well. Ever since the uh, March release, there's been a preview added as well. So if you go ahead and go to our options and settings, go to options, there is this thing in the preview screen, the preview screen where you, where you can go ahead and look at these kind of things. And there is this thing called store data sets using enhanced metadata format. And before I go any further on this, do please do not do this with your critical production data, data sets and reports. Please do not do this. Always make sure that you have a backup of these things. Always make sure that it's not that it's not mission critical. But if you want to test this out, enable the ribbon, enable the button, the thing, and then just go ahead and go ahead and go further with it. Because what is this doing in the back end? It's making sure that the data that's in there is getting uh, the metadata is persisted in a more stable way and because it's persisted in a more stable way this also allows us to use external tools to start editing things in, within power bi and that's where it gets really cool because for in the past i was using a tool called tabular editor which is a tool developed by a danish danish mvp called daniel otkia and um i've been using it to develop to develop tabular models uh, for about a year and a half to two years now. But you can also use it to uh, connect to Power BI files as well. So we can do that the same thing by opening up from a, a local instance and it will connect to the same the same report that I have as well. It will connect to this thing as well. But um, up, until, up until the last version, it gave you a big warning saying that, well, you are doing something that is unsupported. Please do not make any changes. And effectively, if you do it, well, you're on your own. Um, that is slowly being worked away. That is slowly, slowly improving because ta tabular editor is going to be a key thing in connecting to a model and doing more advanced things to this. But the main reason why for now, I'm still using this for Power BI is because you have this thing called a best practice analyzer. And what this does is that it runs a bunch of sets and checks and it gives you back a checklist and it gives you back a report of what violations you might have. And then in tabular model, um, you can just create a fixed script, you can generate a fixed script and execute that instantly as well. Um, I have not tested it fully yet in Power BI, but I'm assuming that it will be done, but it will be getting there as well in the future. Um, so I will just add a new file as well to make sure that I've got everything in there that I need to run for now. So by just I'm using the standard file that Daniel provides on his website as well, and there's a bunch of checks being done there. Meaning, for instance, um, are there format strings for are, are there format strings configured for measures that are out there? Um, is the summarization property set for numeric columns? Those kind of things. Not all of them have to do with, with performance issues as well, but they are general things that you can keep an eye on as well. And if you don't agree with any of these rules, with some of these rules, that's not a big problem. They are all based in JSON. And you and just make your own rules and that's effectively what you should be doing as well is that you should be thinking with your colleagues and, and your organization about what's important for us and if you go ahead and make these rules and get them added into a JSON file well you can effectively just connect to any model that we have so it's the same model that I've, that I've, that I've connected to before it's everything that I've, in, that I've got in there well it is the fact that I can just run this best practice analyzer and it gives me an entire list of well what are the violations on the rules that I've, that I've made? And that is something very cool because by using the VertiPack analyzer and this one, I can have an overview of what's being done in a model in five minutes or less. Because that is what I always do before going into a report that someone else made. I load up these two tools, I check what's inside the model, what's, what's running against my set of best practices, and then I can go ahead and start doing some quick wins because that's what I said very much in the beginning as well, is when we're going for those kind of quick wins, this allows us to, to, well, this allows us to do some very quick things as well, because this instantaneously gives us a list of things that they can go ahead and fix. And while they're going ahead and fixing those things, we can dig deeper into other things, going into more advanced things that need some context and need some information. 
the, the thing that, I've, that springs to mind as well is that I forgot to explain to you how you can connect it to your model, which is also a very important thing. Because it is a power pivot model for VertiPack Analyzer, and that power pivot model connects to the local machine. So all we have to do is just going to our power pivot model and making sure that we can edit that we can edit the data source information that's out there. So we can go ahead and connect to my local host instance, which is local host and then a port number. But how, how can we go ahead and find that port number? Well, the most easy way that I can show you, tell you now is just look at DAX Studio because it has it effectively just here. It has it, it has it underneath in the service bar, meaning that it is connecting to local host uh, 51388. So if I go ahead and do that as well, so 51388, and then connect it to the catalog that's just out there for me, that's everything that I need to do. I just need to close it off and refresh my data, and I can look at all the data that's inside there. Um, DAX Studio allows for a less cumbersome way to connect to this, but like I said, at this point, there is not the level of detail that you can have inside of DAX Studio that you can have in the Excel file. So for now, I'm sticking with the Excel file, and when it gets updated, I'll go there as well. But for now, this is for me the most important thing. But the combination of these things, these four tools that I mentioned just now, is pretty much whatever I do when I start, I start looking at these things. Well, what's the performance analyzer pain? What kind of visual is giving me issues? DAX Studio, how is this hitting my storage in cache? Is my model sufficient? If you're using VertiPack Analyzer or DAX Studio VertiPack Analyzer to go, well, what's my model? What's the internals? And then using that tabular editor as well to go ahead and look at our best practices being followed. So in the future, I will be using tabular editor as well to go and to go and do some advanced scripting, to go generate things as well for me, to do more advanced things as well. Um, and I've included a link at the end of the presentation to Power BI Tips because they're doing a series right now as we speak about using tabular editor. And this will become very, very important. I highly recommend you go look at that. But there are other tools out there that I do use as well. They depend on the scenario and where I'm at and the fact that can I install custom software on the laptop that I'm using now? Because that is, this is not always the case. There are effectively customers that um, that do not allow me to install custom software. And then it is some way of hacking things with making it a portable, a portable application or smuggling an Excel file on there. But it is not always the case. So I have to improvise, adapt, and overcome sometimes to, to get where I need to be. But the main thing is that um, this is how we can effectively just go ahead and get started with things. The main thing that I do want to give to you as well is that, well, what do we need to avoid? What is the thing that we need to look at to, to avoid these kind of things? Well, and it is just simple three golden rules that we can get started with. That is, if, if we're going to look at data, if we're going to transform data, which we always do, because when we're going from flat files or, or flat table towards the star schema, there will always be transformations. Try to do it as early as on as you can in the, in, in the flow. If you've got a data warehouse, great, do it in a data warehouse. If you do not have a data warehouse, well, there's always Power Query, there's data flows that we can use, there's all sorts of things. But at the very least, try to get it persisted inside your model, meaning do not use calculated columns because they kill performance very, very badly. But also the fact is that if you're doing transformations, well, you pretty much want to do them only once because if we're if we're looking at if we're looking at transformations that's being done inside the data warehouse load and then we're changing them again in power query and then we've changed our mind and we're changing them again in the calculated column well that's three times the data is being picked up and three times the data has to be manipulated which can be done very more efficiently which boils down to the third point as well is that well if you're doing those kind of transformations you mainly want to make sure that they're being done smart efficient once and that is, that is the very important thing about doing anything with your data model. Because the main thing as well is for your data model, it is that data types really do matter. Because if we're looking at our model, well, um, if, if I were to go back to my VertiPack analyzer, the, the main thing is that Power BI handles integer values and whole numbers very, very efficiently. It really does this very efficient, efficiently. It can compress those things really good. And it is something that you always want to be striving for. Or another example is that if you're using decimal numbers, do you really need to have six decimal six decimal numbers behind 
the decimal point. Is that really required? Because all of these things, all of these extra numbers that you have will, will only just increase the number of unique values that you have. And every unique value has to be stored once at least and cannot be cannot be optimized in size that, um, that, that dictionary. So it is thinking about these kind of data types that really gives you a very big edge. And I will show you in a minute as well where I'm going with this as well. But the thing is that we also have this setting called auto date time. And this is the first thing that I always disable on any machine that I'm working with for Power BI. Because auto date time is really good to get started to quickly prototype something um, with, with a simple Excel file, for instance. And this will generate for each date that we have inside our model, this will generate a table, a calculate table statement, an in-memory table. But this will generate this for the minimum value to the maximum value. And let's say that we have uh, 40 or 50 dates inside our model. Well, it takes the minimum and the maximum of those 40 to 50 dates, and it generates a table for each and every one of them. So I've had, I've had the worst scenario that I've encountered was uh, a customer where I had 215 dates and they had a data warehouse that defaulted to um, the date is unknown. So it was January 1st, to, uh, January 1st, 1900. And they had a default value for the date is yet to be defined. And that was 2000, uh, well, 2099, December 31st. So that effectively just generated 200 years to the date level for 215 of those things. Uh, and that really blew up the model completely. So by disabling that feature and by just using a simple persistent date, I got the model down by 70% by just one swift change, which is something that you really need to be aware of because this can really kill whatever you have. And then also the thing is that how much and how many of these column and rows are effectively being used? Is all the data in there that we have is that effectively do we need it can we kill off some of those columns because they're not used and the most common the most common example that i can give you is the fact that well let's say that we have a unique identifier in there or something or a primary key of a table well if it's not being used to build a relationship you really want to get that out of there because if it's not being used inside a relationship or inside a calculation it's just eating it's just eating data set size and because it's a unique key it'll also not compress because it is one entry per row that you have. So for instance, the fact table that I had, the, the big one has 90 million rows. Well, it is 90 million times this unique value. And that is data that's never been used. So throwing that out really can, can give you a big, a, big chunk of, a big chunk of data set size back. So why am, I, why am I hammering on this thing for modeling as well is that I will show you just now as well is that by getting the model size down, this will allow the Power BI engine to really effectively look at what data is in there. It allows you to do it quicker as well. The thing is as well is that a star schema design is optimized for Power BI. Star schemas, Power BI thrives on them, which is very important for this as well. And then most importantly is that whenever we're doing more complex decks, it can usually, I'm saying usually, not all of the time, can usually be really simplified by having a star schema behind it. And then that is something that I really want to give to you as well, is a look at star schema modeling, look at dimension modeling, because it will really help you to up your game in Power BI. But let's get back to why I keep saying this. So I have, I have the data set size of my report that I've been showing. Well, it is, oops, sorry, it is what I'm looking at. So I've started off with a base file, and this base file has a, a base size of about 950 megabytes. Well, this is based on CSV files. I'm not saying that it's good to have that many CSV files in there, but this is based on about 3.7 gigabytes. So by just reading in the base file and not having any of the data types properly set, I can have a compression of about three times, which is which is good, but it's not it's not properly what I want to be looking at. So if I take it a step further and go ahead and look at, um, well, what is what is the data types? If I set things to integer values, whole numbers, decimal numbers, and all those kind of things, well, it shaves off a big chunk as well, which is good because this, this will allow me to keep going. And then looking further on, well, where am I looking at is, well, let's keep, let's keep digging on, let's keep digging towards data set sizes and let's, let's disable that auto date time setting. 
well, this shaves off another 80 megabytes as well, which is really good. So I'm getting somewhere. And then again, let's just keep working. Let's eliminate a bunch of these things that I'm not using. Okay, well, so I've effectively been able to skip about 40% of my data set size by just changing data types, removing all automatic date times, and, and, and removing out automatic removing unused columns in there. So I went down to 550 megabytes for 3.7 gigabytes of CSV files, which is good. But then let's look at the big change, which is star schemas. So this one went down to 160 megabytes. 160 megabytes coming from 950 megabytes in a base file coming from 3.7 gigabytes is, is a very big change. And that is that is where we're looking at as well. And then um, I've intentionally put some calculated columns in there to, to convince you as well that this blows up the model. And that is, that is a very important thing to keep in mind because once again, if that data set is smaller, we can really go quicker into looking looking into the data into data set side, the details that we need in the data set. And usually those dimensional models handle the, the things that we need most properly as well. But I will quickly go on as well and then um, give you some best practices for modeling as well that we can maybe well that I can hope you can take home with you as well. The most important thing is that well we want to be looking at star schemas as much as we possibly can because that's a really important one. Star schemas are the number one choice for Power BI. And then, if we're looking at keys to base to base our um, if we're looking at keys to base our model to base our model on, well, for relations, we want to look at persistent surrogate keys, meaning integer values, whole numbers that are persistent inside the model because they compress very well. And if we're using those in a fact table that essentially is just comprised of of foreign keys and measures, this will allow the compression to become really efficient. And this will allow all of the queries that need to look at these things, all the filtering and slicing that needs to be done in a super efficient way. This is this is pretty much the best way that we can use it. And then um, bidirectional filtering pretty much kills performance and should only be used when uh, when we really need it, when you know why you need it. And if if you do have if you do have cases scenarios where you need to have bidirectional filter. You may want to look at the cross filter function in DAX because this will allow you to granularly control what needs to be done. And then auto date time should be disabled as much as possible. And then we could rather have things our physical date time and mark it as a date table. Role playing dimensions should be debated. Uh, purely performance wise, there's marginal gains to be to be had if it is persistent inside your model, but it's marginal gains. It is more the uh, discussion that you need to have about. Is it effectively, is it more usable if we have more dimensions in there or not? That is something that you should debate with your team and your end users. Data types, if we optimize them as much as possible, this will really allow us to have the optimization and the compression that we really need. And then looking at Y tables and those unused columns. If we don't need it, you may as well just throw it out there, just remove it from the model. And if it's needed afterwards, you can always just re-add it as well. And then you can also have the discussion about why do you need it? Why why should it be used? It, it is very tempting to just throw everything in there and then you don't have to make any more changes if people need something else. It is very, it is very, very tempting. But if you're looking at performance efficient models, this is not the way that we should be looking at. So I will skip more than a few slides to go back to so to one thing that I do want to tell you as well. There is a bunch of more content in there and I, I highly recommend you go look at it uh, when the slides are being shared. But there is this thing as well is that I do want you to be aware of the fact that the choice of a browser is very important in whatever we're doing. Because um, back in August uh, 2019 by now I think, uh, Chris Hamill who's a member of the Power BI CAT team uh, tweeted about a uh, comparison that he did using multiple browsers. So there is, things have changed by now because um, there is there is more browsers that are released by now. But if I go ahead and look at this one, if I go ahead and look at this one, he makes up, uh, he, makes, he makes a comparison between Edge Dev, the Chromium based browser and Edge. But the fact is that Edge Dev was done rendering that report in about, in about 10 seconds, 11 seconds, and the older Edge 
took very longer took a very longer time to render that same report. And it is just the same machine rendering it, but just a different to a different browser. And there is a difference of about 20 seconds on this visually intensive report, agreed, but there is a big difference in there as well. Um, and the difference is also very much noticeable when you're using Firefox, for instance, or if you're using Internet Explorer, the difference is very noticeable. So again, works on my machine is the most terrible of answers that you can ever give because it really has a very big effect on what we're doing. Okay, so there are some takeaways that I do want to give you before we go ahead into questions as well. And that is that report performance should be thought of as much as possible at design time because we can avoid things from happening. If we can prevent those things from happening, this will allow you to save time later on. And then how you can pretty much do that the best thing as well, how you can do that the most efficient way as well, is by looking at your transforms. What are you doing? What are you doing with your transformations? Do they need to be done the way that you're doing them? Are they being done early on in the process? Are they being done smart? Because those save you a lot of time as well. And it's not only about performance that you have on the rendering time of your reports, but it's also about how, when the model is rendered, how, when the model is compressed. That is also a very important metric as well. Modeling is key, as I mentioned to you before. And then the browser and the device your user is using it is very important as well. There is a link inside the reference materials that I'm sharing as well. Um, Chris Webb's been doing some very interesting work on, on troubleshooting more in depth on, on visual rendering inside browsers. And that is a really interesting reading material if you've got an hour or two to kill because it is it is fairly comprehensive and it is it is it is cool stuff that he's been doing as well. And then I cannot encourage you enough to go ahead and look at Tabular Editor to look at making this tool your own and look at how it can effectively help you to go to go be more productive for Power BI, how it can help you to quickly change things, how it can help you to assess the state of a model and then define actions that you need to take. But keep on learning because that's effectively what we do all need to be keeping doing. Um, and it is your own time right now probably, or it is or it is time that you're investing into learning right now, which is a good thing. So keep doing that and keep improving yourself. If you hit a snag somewhere, that's not, that's not a bad thing. We all make mistakes sometime. Um, I, I do the occasional screw up more than once and it just helps me learn. And that is something that you really do need to keep in mind. But if there is a bunch of resources in there that I recommend you read to get started on these things, the topics that I've discussed, if there is any questions that you do need to have later on, you can get them to me here by using the social channels. And then I will ask Mark or Nikki if there's any questions. Yeah, Benny, um, we have a, a few few questions over here. Um, yep. The first one is regarding the performance. Um, is sorting the data set still important for performance? Uh, well, it depends, which is the most shitty answer I can ever give you. Um, well, off the top of my head, I'd have to go deeper into it, but off the top of my head, I'd say that it is not that important because compression compression works, well, if the column store engine is working, it'll automatically be sorting the data anyway. So it is not that important for, for performance if you pre-sort data in your, inside your model, um, because I do assume that the column store engine does that already for itself. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, and there's one more. Um, um, you were showing the, the difference between the uh, the models with the vertebrae analyzer between the uh, CSV yeah. files you loaded into a Power BI desktop. Um, um, it might be a, a more a bit more um, elaborated question. Um, can you show the data model uh, difference between the version four and five? That's where you make that uh, a star schema. So how you did it uh, exactly? Uh, actually, well, uh, I can. Well, I'll effectively just show you the, the I'll just show you the, the Power BI desktop file as well. The, the model as well. Meaning that it is just this is a really simple one because it, it just it's just a simple star schema which is which is whatever we need to have. But it is it starts off from having these big old uh, these big CSV files that come in with references to uh, a few things like station information um, and that's it I think. 
some that's the most information I did. So I went out to split all of those things into separate to separate dimension tables and then made sure that it had uh, foreign keys towards all of these things because I want my fact tables to be either measures that are in there, calculated or persisted, uh, and then foreign keys towards other things. That's the only thing that I want to have inside my inside my fact table. And the model okay. came from the model came from what we have here. Uh, step two and step four are not that different. Um, meaning that there's just a bunch of these fields like latitudes and longitudes that, that are being changed and then end station name and those kind of things are thrown out. So that's the biggest change that I made inside that model. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, you were showing the, um, the different browser rendering speeds. Uh, yep. There's a question on that. Um, have you done any testing on how the machine hardware specs influence the render speed? I have not done any of that testing, but um, there is the, the links that I've that I've included here on um, the work that Chris Webb is doing goes into yeah, right. that a bit. It goes into that a bit, but I have not done any testing myself. No. Okay. Um, and one more. Maybe a bit off topic, but any recommendations on Power BI load testing? Would you recommend a PowerShell tool that Microsoft released in 2019 or any other tools that you uh, know or use? Um, I've not I've not been using that load tool, load testing tool overly often um, because I have not effectively had the question of, of, of load testing at the dedicated capacity for it. But if I were to have to do it, that would be the starting point for me as well. Um, but I cannot give any advice on that. Okay, we'll have to check that. Um, uh, okay, um, and one more question. Where can we find the slides? So the sheet deck. Um, well, that's the question I, I, I have for you guys. Are you sending out the slides or, or do, I, do I really need to force myself to get a GitHub set up where they can find the slides? Because <laughs> I've been putting <laughs> no, that off for about three months. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. We we will send them uh, anyway, um, and you're free to uh, set up a GitHub if you want. But that's not yeah, necessary. I, I've, been, no. I've been postponing it for about three months, so I have to do it sometime. But yeah, um, I will definitely send you the slides, and then you can send them off to the people that, uh, that registered. And then I will pick some time somewhere to set up Git and and whatever I need to do. Yeah, okay. You can uh, you can copy my uh, my GitHub if you want. I also set up GitHub and slide uh, slide deck and. Uh, Presentations. Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's um, uh, the questions for now. All right. So, uh, Benny, uh, thank many, many, thanks, many thanks to you. Yep. And good luck on future sessions. I do hope that they can be in person. And I will probably pop over one time as well because the bus is, it's about 40 minutes for me. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope we, uh, we can do that in. Um, well, in a, in a few months uh, or a little bit later, yes, it will be great. Definitely. So um, thank you everyone for joining. If there's anything, just reach out to Nikki, Mark or myself later on, and then we can gladly keep on going. All right. Yes. Good evening. Thanks, or, good day, wherever you are. Good morning. Yeah. Good evening. Yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, we also understood and um, experienced it ourselves. There were um, um, several issues with the audio. Um, our apologies for that. Um, yeah, there wasn't uh, much that we uh, could do right now. Um, we will try to check if, if a different setup maybe uh, could help in the future. Um, as we said, uh, the recordings and the slide deck will be sent to, um, um, to your email and also be made available uh, uh, on YouTube. So uh, you can check that out later. Um, and check out powerbidays.com for any future events. You can um, sign up to the mailing list um, and check our Twitter, um, Power BI Days uh, NL, for uh, any updates on that. Thank you all and um, see you or I'll speak to you uh, later.